Nevertheless, was it possible for the Skoll Group to have perpetrated a massive hoax? These things are so extraordinary that when one tells them to people who've not had the experiences themselves, they think oh, it must be trickery. And the challenge then always is, OK, you duplicate it. But so far, no one has been able to do this. Nevertheless, critics still claim that the events at Skoll were produced by the kinds of conjuring tricks used by stage magicians and entertainers. As you find them, you find them in this manner, like this, you see. Because professional magicians learn all the skills of illusion and misdirection. I'm not going to show you how it's done, because if I showed you how it was done, you'd tell everybody else. They are also well qualified to detect this type of fraud. Hey, presto. With that in mind, James Webster was invited to scrutinise a number of Skoll sessions. Webster is a member of the Magic Circle in Britain and has been a professional magician for over 40 years. Well, I had an opportunity to view the cellar. I could see no magic props or anything which made me feel inclined to think there was any hoaxing or, or trickery. But could he replicate the events at school? I could not do it myself as a professional magician. And I don't believe in any magician that uh, I knew could do even the lighting, let alone the other phenomena that I witnessed. Any one of those in the cellar, I'd say they were wasting their time doing this here for nothing and they could be earning <laughs> a million dollars out there on the stage. In 1999, after an exhaustive two-year investigation, the investigators published their conclusions in the SPR's official proceedings. They were looking for evidence of a hoax. They sifted evidence for signs of fakery. But did they find it? If you take all the phenomena within the whole of the Skoll experiment over two years while we were there, I would say that the possibility of fraud and faking was nil. Although the Skoll report includes theoretical discussions about how individual phenomena might have been faked, the chief investigators concluded that events at Skoll cannot be explained either by known scientific laws or by trickery. But psychology professor Chris French, the co-editor of Skeptic magazine, remains unconvinced. There's lots of claimed evidence for life after death coming from lots of different sources. The debate should be about the quality of the evidence. At the moment, on the basis of the available evidence, I'm not at all convinced that there is such a thing as life after death. I think the sceptics regard the possibility of the survival of human consciousness as inherently so impossible that anyone must be rather crazy to believe it. But when you look at the evidence, you have to ask yourself whether you'd be even more crazy not to believe it or to find some alternative explanation which makes any sort of sense. And I haven't found one. When we die, we go into another world. A lot of worlds. 3,665 30, worlds. Because uh, I, I read it in the Bible. News of the amazing events at Skoll spread around the world. In 1997, they were invited to hold sessions in four European countries and the United States. Some of the most successful sessions occurred in the Los Angeles home of Brian Hurst. We wanted to see whether it could also take place so many thousands of miles away from Skoll here in Southern California. Hurst's converted garage was the venue for eight sessions. As many as 30 people attended each one. Oh, hi! Hello, Cynthia. Hi, nice to see you? you. Great. Before each session, investigators carefully inspected the room. Many people went in at different times before the sessions and there was no, no paraphernalia, there was nothing hidden there at all. 
Despite being interviewed a decade after the Skoll experiment, these witnesses are still profoundly moved by what they saw. There was so much phenomena going on. It was really overwhelming. As with most sessions, visitors began by sitting quietly in total darkness. Then they started hearing the voices of their spirit team speaking through the mediums. Be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Marie. 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 Then the darkened room burst into life. Isn't that cool? Look at that. That is awesome. Wow. It's like a firefly. Like fireworks. Wow. And then it would go up to the rafters of the garage and come down and thunk hard like a big rock hitting the table and then disappear. As well as these amazing balls of light, furniture in the room began to move. We had a, a table in the center of the room that had crystals on it. It's moving. The table is indeed levitating. The table levitated, was turned on its side and began to spin very rapidly. The crystals never fell off. Even if there hadn't been crystals on the table, it would have been impossible to have turned the table sideways and rotated it with the speed at which it rotated. And we could see this because there were luminescent strips on the table. And it began to spin around actually so rapidly it almost looked like a pinwheel. As well as familiar spirit communicators, other voices the group say belong to dead relatives also attempted to communicate. What? We're several hours early. We're, we're several Someone hours early. Someone for Shirley. Yes. Dad? Speak to Hi, Dad. I really do feel that um, my dad came and he was the one who put his hands on my shoulders. Oh. Um, the way we were situated in the room, my chair was right up against a wall and there was no way another person could be behind me. Then another hand appeared in front of them. But who did it belong to? There was a particular communicator called Reg Lawrence, who was an engineer in his lifetime and who became very expert at producing voices from midair. Oh, Hello, Reg. Hello, Brian. Very nice of you to have us here. Oh, you just touched my hand. Oh, oh, oh yes. Oh, oh, he's stroking it. It's slightly cold, but it's flesh. He's shaking my hand. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> you wretch, you've, you've made my year. You've made mine. <laughs> As usual, Lawrence did not communicate through the mediums. Instead, the group could hear his voice projected from different parts of the room. Some of the voices were moving around the room, even a high up in the rafter area that... Uh, Somebody would have had to climb up on a ladder to, to get up there, and there's no way that that was happening. The spirit team also came to be regarded as healers by the participants. Has it gone inside you, that light? It's in my chest right now. It was right there around my heart, and I have a little bit of a heart problem. Wow. I was diagnosed with cancer, and a very fast-moving, dangerous cancer. I sat with school, and probably two to three weeks later, I had biopsies again and they came back completely negative. <laughs> All of the visitors attending the LA session said the experience changed their lives forever. When you walk out of that room, you definitely feel like you've been exposed to something very extraordinary. We actually saw the spirits. And that's got to be positive evidence for survival. We do live on after death. They certainly proved that to us that night. Being survived in Auschwitz, and also my parents were killed in Auschwitz, including my 11-year-old brother, who was killed on arrival, with my parents, and I just cannot accept it that they, that should be the end of them. Previously, we have shown how experiments at Skoll and with Bachi provide powerful evidence for life after death. But some researchers think there may be another possible explanation.